<laughs> All right, everyone. I have a very, very special guest here today. Now I feel like I have a little bit of pressure because I'm literally with the man who speaks better than anyone that I've ever heard on television. TV t- TV play-by-play announcer for your Cleveland Guardians alongside Rick Mann. You can catch him every game. Uh, he's going his 17th season in TV. Wow, has it been that long? 17. That's what it said on, on your Wikipedia page uh, with the Indians slash Guardians. Uh, yeah, we do Wikipedia here. I'm a big... big <laughs> then it J- has to be true. Big J journalism. Yeah. Uh, also, but 24 total, including radio. Career. Did I, are you learning well, yeah, this for the first time? Be, this will be my 25th season total. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> well, that's a great start. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But also, while you take a sip of water, going back to the high school days, he's also an Ashland County Sports Hall of Famer where he set the all time record in completion percentage. So you know that my boy, Matt Underwood, he is precise he is accurate <laughs> he is all over the place ladies and gentlemen matt thank you so much for your time man thanks so much for, for coming on awesome it's great to be here and uh i should point out that back then when i set that record we threw eight, eight passes a game yeah okay so I, was, a I was different I was, era i was wondering <laughs> I, I wanted to put it in perspective how many passes exactly were you throwing back what was it 1985 yeah we probably threw i'm guessing we we probably threw about 100 passes for the whole season <laughs> it's deep <laughs> Matt, details. Yes, These are exactly. details you don't share. Nobody needs to know that. Yeah, but, nobody, uh, nobody yeah. needs to know that. Uh, you know, so, you know, love watching you with, with Guardians on Bally's, um, and you just do a fantastic job. But, you know, you, you're so busy during from April, basically, until September, October. I want to know what you do in the off season. We're sitting right now here in February. You're not with the team right now in Arizona. You were there for a few weeks, it sounded like, and yeah. then going back. But, you know, from... October till, you know, February. What, what, what is Matt Underwood's life looking like? You know, it's changed. It's obviously transitioned over the years. Uh, when I was younger, early in my career, my kids were little. Yeah. And so when the season would end, it, it was just full-time dad duties. Sure. And because, you know, during the baseball season, there's so many things that you miss. You know, birthday parties, anniversaries, weddings, uh, all the things that normal people do, barbecues, yeah. Memorial Day, Labor Day, 4th of July, all that stuff, I'm gone, or I have a game to do. So uh, I, I kind of felt like if I ever wrote a book back then, I was thinking I would title the book, I'd love to, but I have a game. Because you get asked to do a lot of things <laughs> yeah. by your friends, and that's like, uh, I, I'd like to come, but I have a game tonight. And it's funny how many of my friends over the years – knew what job I had, but would forget that there's a game. They would be like, oh, do you have a game tonight? Sure. It's like, dude, there's a game every night. Yeah, check the schedule, the man. Schedule. Yeah. <laughs> crack, crack open the newspaper one time and look at the schedule. Yeah. And so uh, I think a lot of the offseason early for me was just, you know, kid stuff. Yeah. Going to their games, uh, piano recitals, dance rehearsals, all those type of things. Um, vacations. Yeah. You know, we would take our family vacations in my off season. So now that my kids are grown and out of the house, it's time for my wife and I to do a little traveling. So this year, this, this past off season, we went to Italy. First time I'd ever Did you? Uh, been to Europe. Yeah. And that was fantastic. Congrats on all your success, man. What I'll a, tell you what. What a great world. <laughs> Where'd you go in Italy? So we, we hit, uh, went to Rome, uh, then we went to Florence, um, and we went throughout wine country, all throughout Tuscany, uh, some really cool little villages. We went to Montalcino. Uh, Montepulciano, we went to Poggio del Sasso. Uh, it was just a fantastic uh, experience. You've got the names down, I'll tell you that right now. My wife, she studied Italian for like, I mean, I think she did Duolingo for 300 consecutive days. Really? Never missed a day. And so she was she was pretty good at being able to speak and, and understand. I, you know, I, I picked up a couple little catchphrases, and I would just repeat them over to the annoyance of everyone. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I was in the Dominican Republic this, uh, like, in November, and I got, like, a D in high school Spanish. Like, didn't do anything in, in college. I get to Iowa, and they were like, um, oh, so you have to take two years of Spanish. And I was like, I did not know that I had to do this. I probably wouldn't have come here. I thought I got the prerequisite <laughs> done when I was in high school. Uh, so then one of I like struggled through Spanish. And this is such a long-winded uh, story. But I struggled through Spanish. I go take it at the community college. Still, I'm like, I'm halfway through the semester. I have an F+. Plus. And my buddy is like, you know, you're, you're diagnosed ADD, right? And I was like, yes, I am. And he's like, you can go to the school psychologist and test out of taking like a language. So I took cultural classes instead. It was fantastic. 
Wow, the things they didn't tell you. I know. Leading up to you, got to read the fine print. You got to be a finagler over here. It's funny because I, when I think back on it in high school, I took French. Did you? Like who? Why? That's who not going to help you at all. Who ever going to use French unless you travel to France? Yeah. And do international business or something. I, I, I don't know. I guess back in the eighties, uh, no one thought that Spanish is a definitely a, a more common secondary language in yeah. the United States because it would have been a lot more beneficial to me had I learned even a little bit of Spanish. Yeah, so I go to I go to Dominican, and you know I think they appreciate when you say some kind of Spanish. At least give it a shot. And I numerous times this happened. I would get it, or I'd go check out, or something like that. And um, I would say like uno mas or gracias or you know that's basically it. Or, or like puedo ir al baño. Like where's the bathroom? And they're like, oh, you know, habla español. I go, oh, no, no, <laughs> no. That's you, you've reached my max. Thank you for 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 believing in me and everything. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's always fun going out and you know learning new cultures and getting immersed in that. Um, went by the Guardians. Um, uh, uh, what is it? The, the Dominican the, Academy. The, the Academy yeah. there. I mean, it's a really uh, great thing that they have there. But, um, you know, back to you, back to your career. You know, you've been in this for, you know, doing uh, with the Guardians for, you said, 25th season, including yeah. TV yeah. and radio. Yeah. You know, what has this past 25 years meant to you? I mean, I mean, this has to have been just a dream job for you. I think for anyone who doesn't want to, play or who can't like people like me uh who like i i dreamed of playing in the sure. major leagues and that wave bye bye to me i think i i should have realized at 12 um and then i think i was still going for it at 18 but then after that you you know the, the other dream is like it would be great just to be around baseball and to call and be like man these guys have the dream job so is this a dream job for you has it been without a doubt i think that like you like every Probably like every kid my age anyway, when I was growing up in Ashland, Ohio, you, you thought you wanted to be a pro athlete. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, from the time I was six years old, the only thing that I was ever interested in was some contest that had a scoreboard. Sure. Um, I mean, I, when I think back to studies in high school, like, I, I didn't care one thing about biology, chemistry, algebra. Same. Uh, none of those things held any interest. The only thing I was remotely interested in was history and, you know, like literature or writing, uh, you know, reading stories, writing stories. Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, I would dabble in some of the arts, uh, you know, whether they be, you know, drama productions, musicals. I was in the choir a little bit, um, you know, but if it wasn't sports or arts, I, the school was just not interesting to me. I yeah. just didn't, I didn't enjoy it. So, um, I think I was always drawn to, to playing sports. And, you know, if you, if you were a kid and you played sports, especially growing up in the 1970s like I did, you know, we didn't have a lot of access to, to the next level. Yeah. You saw what you saw on, on television, which was three channels. So you either saw a Big Ten game, a Big 12 game, a Pac-10 game, or an NFL game. That was it. You didn't see mid-level college. I didn't know that even existed. Totally. You know, I thought you <laughs> went to Ohio. Any obscure sport under the sun. Yeah, I thought as a kid, if you didn't go to Ohio State, there was no other college in yeah. Ohio. That was it. That was the only college in Ohio is the way I thought. So, again, you, you play at sports as a kid. If you're good and you play, you feel like, oh, I can, I can maybe make it to the pros. Sure. Then you get to high school and you, the field starts to level out and you realize, okay, this is going to be a lot harder than I realized. And then if you're lucky enough to go to college – even at, I went to Division Three at Baldwin Wallace, and you know I showed up on campus. We had a hundred freshman football players wow. showed up my freshman year. I you were gonna say there's a hundred students there. I was like, that seems light. Yeah, 1986. <laughs> I showed up for freshman for football practice. There was a hundred freshmen, let alone the guys who were already on the varsity roster. Yeah. And so that's when you quickly realized, whoa, this is a different world. And that's Division Three where there are no scholarships. And imagine the D2. D1, and then the big boy D1 level. Yeah. So that's when you start, the reality hits you, like this is not a long-term vocation option. Yeah. But so then I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm, I've made the decision to go to college only because really I wanted to keep playing sports, play, keep playing football, and now I have to figure out what do I want to do? And I had no, I really had no idea. Yeah. I mean, I majored in business administration because – I, at least I know some people that are in business. <laughs> yeah, my, I can name a few businesses. My dad's in a business. Uh, uh, my friend's dads are in a business. I don't know anybody in the entertainment world. Yeah. 
So forget that. That's a pipe dream. So I went to school to major in business and literally had no idea if I was going to be able to do anything with that if I had followed that. And, you know, as my wife has told me so many times, you know, you, you are where you're supposed to be in life. Totally. You know, no matter what you do to try and turn the wheel, you're going to end up where you're supposed to be. And for whatever reason, this was, this was the path that kept drawing me back. Yeah. You know, the, this sort of this radio, television type deal. And, and at Baldwin Wallace, uh, after two years of, of you know, futility in terms of trying to play football, I realized that was, that was over. And that's when I transitioned to doing the games on the campus radio station. Fortunately, we had a tiny campus radio station that was 100 watts. Okay. There, there are freaking light bulbs right here <laughs> yeah, that, that had like... more power than my campus radio station that's did. That's unreal. But it was all run by students, yeah. uh, operated by students. So it was your chance to go out and figure it out, learn on the job. Um, you know, the only people that were really listening were maybe some parents, yeah. you know, maybe a few school administrators checking the score. Uh, but that was, that was it. So you had to, this chance to go out and try things and see what worked and what didn't work. And that, just, that was the first domino that fell to me eventually – getting into this business, this crazy business uh, of, of the, you know, broadcasting world. But it wasn't, that wasn't the plan. I mean, I didn't go to school thinking that this is what I'm going to do. Sure. But that's, that's how it ended up working out. Yeah. And m much like me, I went to school with no plan. I had a <laughs> general idea of what I wanted to do and 90% of it was uh, beer and co-eds. But don't basically. you think that's great? Don't <laughs> I you think, think that was great. There's nothing wrong. I tell kids all the time that ask me about like, hey, yeah, I want to do this. How do I? Look, college is not necessarily for everybody. And this is a tangent I want to get into because I think yeah. this is kind of interesting. But it, there's also nothing wrong with going to college and figuring it out when you get there. Because what I realized is I went to school to major in business and found broadcasting. And if you find something there, it's okay to pivot. Yeah. Now, if you go to school to be a doctor and halfway through change your mind, that's a bigger pivot. A much bigger pivot. <laughs> Maybe yes. a costlier one yeah. or, or, or <laughs> vice versa, deciding halfway through you want to be a doctor. It's going to be a lot more money out of the pocket. But yeah. Point is, there's nothing wrong with figuring it out as you go because something might catch your eye when you're there and that's okay to go to college without a declared major i think it's awesome for kids that know exactly what they want to do god bless them i didn't you didn't a yeah. lot of people don't and that's okay too because something will pop up and you and you'll figure it out but the other thing about college when i think back on it is you know my i'm of the generation my parents were sort of that first generation of americans to that to, to experience upward mobility. Sure. Like they were, their parents were struggling to make ends meet. My parents' generation were the first ones that like, hey, this is, this middle class thing's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, we have a little uh, disposable income. We've got two cars in the garage. We've got a house. And, and so when they handed the ball to us, it was like, go be a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah. You take so this take and the next you ring. keep going. Yeah. yeah. And, and hey, for a lot of kids, that was great. But for a lot of us, it's like, I don't want to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> Nor does anyone want me operating on them yeah. or trying to keep them out of jail. <laughs> so, so, you know, again, a lot of us went to college because we were supposed to go to college. Yep. Not necessarily because we really wanted to, but because you were just supposed to. That's just what everybody was doing. So, you know, you go to college and then... Well, now what? Now I'm here. Totally. And you're trying to figure it out. So I think a lot of kids my age, again, I, you know, I graduated high school in 1986, college in 1990. So if you're, in that, if you're in that age bracket out there, you probably know a little bit about what I'm talking about. You just sort of figured it out as you went. And hopefully, like me, you found something that you, you could be passionate about to pursue. And, and, that, and I feel very fortunate that, that I was able to find something and then just, you know, a, you get the right sort of opportunities that come along, but B, you have to be ready. Yeah. When those opportunities are there, are you ready? And that's what athletics taught me. You could be on the bench. When the coach calls your number, you better know the plays. You better be ready to step in and perform, or you might not get called again. Yeah. I mean, it's much like a, a reliever. You know, it's hard to, you know, because when you're, when you're a starter and you're coming in, you, you know you're going to be playing every that, in that five days. So that day you have your, your off day or, you know, you, you have that routine. But, you know, as we were talking a little bit ago, pitcher third inning, 
poops the bed, you know, and lets up three home runs or whatever it may be, you got to be ready to roll in five minutes and, and be out there and be ready to perform. Can but, I use that on the air? Absolutely. Poops the bed? Do you think yeah. Is that I said poop on the air the other day. Yeah. I was talking about uh, the, the, uh, the updates that they're making at Cleveland Hopkins Airport, and I said that there's uh, an $18 million that are going in, or $8 million, and uh, some of it's going to renew all of the 11 bathrooms. So I said, now we can poop and pee in peace here at uh, <laughs> yeah. Cleveland Hopkins Airport. Um, and, you know, I think my boss was like, did he really just say poop <laughs> and pee on television? This is WKYC. We can't not, be doing that. Not one, but both. <laughs> both, yeah. You know, if you're going to say one, you might as well say the other. Well, you know, but what I, what I loved what you, what you said is that a lot of the times you are where you're supposed to be, but then it also takes it from you as well. You know, you can be given every opportunity in the world, sure. but it also takes the the vision to see it and the 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 stones to be able to you go. You gotta for it. work at it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. look, the bottom line is, like, you know, I think back to you know, as a as a young kid, and, and I loved playing football, and I loved quarterback. That was what I did, and I loved it. But look, did did anybody outwork Tom Brady and Peyton Manning during their careers? Yeah, no, no. But did they have a little something that the rest of us, no matter how hard we work, could never achieve? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I had a coach. I had a coach once tell me, he goes, "I wish I could put you in that guy's body over there, because mm-hmm. yeah. that guy has all the talent in the world, and he just doesn't care." He goes, "You've got all the intangibles, but you can't put in what God left out." Yeah. And at the time that, you know, whatever it was, 18, 19 year old me <laughs> was, like, I know I'm scrawny. was crushed. <laughs> but like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm 5'11, I'm slow, not really strong arm. I have the intangibles, Accurate, though. but I have all the, I'm missing all the things you really need. Yeah. So Tom Brady and Peyton Manning, and, and when I was a kid, Dan Marino and John Elway, nobody could throw the ball like those guys. They had a special gift. Now they took that gift and, and amplified it by working their tail off. Yeah. But there is something to it, like, you can't you can't take just anybody and put them into a, a certain role because there are just as you say like there are, there are gifts that we're all given and the key is trying to identify those and finding the right fit for them. Sure, you know, and I, I want to look at that at, at your career. You know, so you were you know, Baldwin Wallace, then started working and you know, I'm probably spark noting this a little bit, but worked at Channel Five for a little bit, became one of the youngest sports directors in the country because at the time Cleveland was a little bit bigger market now we're 19 it was a top 15 or it seemed like uh back in the day but that is super young to be a sports director in a huge market and a huge sports city like like Cleveland is a different news city because we lead the newscasts with sports a lot of the time like sports is news here in Cleveland what were some of the early things that you're talking about that you you know you had the Um, maybe the soft skills of like, you know, you have the great voice, you have the presence. What were some of the things that you just worked at and worked at and worked at to make sure that you could put yourself in that position and to become a lead at it? And now, you know, doing the job that people dream to have on the highest level. You know, it's funny in, in some ways it's, I, it's, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, that uh, I didn't have a lot of actual training. Sure. Right. A lot of it was just, you know, go do it. Yeah. And, what I did have, though, and that's I, a lot of media, though, too. It's just it's like shooting free throws. It's yeah. reps. You yeah, know? absolutely. There's yeah. no question about that. But what where I where I had a huge benefit is I, I always say I, I got my undergraduate degree at Baldwin Wallace and my master's degree at Nev Chandler University. Yeah. So when I started at Channel Five, uh, Nev Chandler was the voice of the Browns and mm-hmm. he was the sports director at Channel Five. So much like Jim Donovan at KYC. Yeah. That was a premium position totally and and in and again in the, in the 1990s uh in the early 1990s when i started there and nev was doing the browns he had come off a run where they had gone to the afc championship game three times in four years my four years in college yeah the browns who trained on our campus were in the afc title game one step from the super bowl three times in a four-year span so nev had become sort of the the voice of cleveland sports and all i had to do was show up every day and watch totally and listen you know I wasn't one of these guys who came in and was trying to show everybody how smart I was I just sat back and listened to him and I would ask him questions why did you lead with this story tonight or 
or he would ask me, what do you think about this story? And I'd get nervous. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> don't, don't fail this test. Yeah. Like, actually, I think you le- should have led with this yeah, one. Right. <laughs> so, again, it was just a great learning experience. And not only did I have Nev Chandler, but Doug Deacon yeah. was also a contributing um, reporter at Channel 5. So he was, he was doing the color commentary with Nev on the radio, but he would also be out at Brown's camp, and I would tag along and watch him interact with the players and watch him take a story and put it together uh, uh, for the sportscast. So I had two incredible mentors to just watch yeah. and listen. And Doug's the one that told me a long time ago, I hope he won't be mad that I, I bring this up publicly, but he said, and I was just starting out, he said, in this business, it's like the mafia. Yeah. Keep your friends close. Keep your enemies closer. Because, it, it, you know, this business that we have chosen, it brings out some oddball personalities. It does. And there are people who will smile to your face and stab you in the back Absolutely. the minute they get a chance. So it, Doug was the guy that would like, okay, kid, I, all, everything they said is great, but here's how it really works. Yeah. And he would sort of, you know, walk me through and and show me the pitfalls and the, the slippery slopes that were out there. And Doug Deacon's a Tony Soprano over here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and again, I was, to a large degree, I was a pretty naive kid. I mean, I grew up in Ashland, Ohio, which sure. is a small community. Everybody knows everybody, but you take everybody at face value. If your, your word it means something. And so when you get into a different business where not everybody is on the level, I was shocked. I'm like, what? <laughs> what do you mean yeah. that, that not everybody wants me to succeed? Like, oh, hey, well, kid, come here. <laughs> yeah, in, in college, it's really cute because, you know, you'll give all the advice in the world. But then when they kind of start encroaching on your territory, that's when the secrets stop, stop coming out. <laughs> yeah, when they start playing for keeps, it's a little different game. But, yeah. uh, but it was a great experience, and, and I just learned so much just soaking it all up. And then, uh, you know, just – it's amazing how fast – because the, here's the thing I was told. You need to go to a small market. You need to get experience yep. and then work your way back to Cleveland. You can't just get on the air here in Cleveland. And I, I understood that, but I – without you know without an opportunity, I couldn't get a job at a small market. Totally. I sent tapes to Medford, Oregon, Tupelo, Mississippi. You name it. I sent a tape there, and they all sent very nice letters back. We're looking for somebody with a little more experience. I'm like, how can I get experience – if you won't give me a chance in the small market, absolutely, it was frustrating. And so I was like ready to just throw it all, uh, you know, oh, I, hey, I gave it a shot. It just isn't working out. And I was ready to, to pack it in. And 1992, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on two years out of college. Wow. And I'm working for literally peanuts at Channel 5. So I made such little money that I would drive back and forth to Ashland because wow. I still had to live at home because yeah. – Five dollars an hour, <laughs> twenty hours a week. Oh, geez. Do the math. I couldn't geez. afford anything, so uh, I was ready to just say, "Okay, I tried. It, it just isn't working out." And Nev Chandler recommended me for a job with WVIZ for the high school football and basketball game of the week. Wow! And I got to work with the legendary Mike Massa, who who did those games for years. And so here's Mike, who's again, he's this the legendary high school. Sp- voice of sports in Cleveland and there's this kid who looks like he's still in high school (laughs) doing the games with him but it was my first opportunity to be in front of a camera on the air doing my thing doing what I love to do and that was step one and and, and without Nev that doesn't even happen yeah so that that connection of Nev Chandler got me that first opportunity and then you know little by little by little I kept you know building the bricks and, and to the point where it became a career. Sure, yeah, and it, I, I love what you were talking about of when you first got your job of just being a sponge, you know, and trying to learn everything, you know, but also coming in there with no ego because, you know, he could have been very annoyed with you and wanted nothing to do with you. Um, like, you know, there have been people, I'm sure I've annoyed, but that, that have come into this building who, but like, are in like a freshman in college and like act like they, they know everything. It's like, okay, chill out. Like, I'm, I'm most likely not gonna help you. Uh, but, you know, the people that come in that are, that are humble, eager, ready to learn, you know, you set yourself up to put that position to where he wanted to help you. So, you know, you go from channel five, go on. Hold on a second, because I'm just thinking, as you say that, that was, that wasn't because I had any special skill. All right. That's because I grew up in a rather large 
ethnic family. Sure. So my mom is 100% Greek. So when we would go to Steubenville, Ohio, which is where my parents were both born and raised, and we would have Greek Easter and, or Christmas dinners, the house would, at my Aunt Marion's house would be packed. And all these crazy Greeks are screaming and yelling. It's loud. It's boisterous. There's wine. There's food everywhere. But the one thing that was very was laid out as a kid is you, kids don't speak. Yeah. You are seen and not heard. I mean, that was a that was a real thing. If you if you spoke up, you might get a backhand like real yeah. quick, or you, or you might be just told get out of here. Yeah. This is the adults' room. Go over there. And so play like with you me. knew your position. So yeah. Life. So yeah. a lot of what I did as a kid was just watching. Totally. And then imitating all my relatives in the back room Yeah, for the other kids. Uh, or to my parents on the drive home, I would imitate Uncle Joe. and you know, Because and, and, it was they were fascinating. These were characters. These weren't people that I knew in Ashland, Ohio. Yeah. In Steubenville, everybody was unique. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my grandpa, uh, he took me down to the Herald Square Cigar Company or cigar store when I was a kid. And uh, I thought he was going to buy cigars. And we went through the cigar store and into the back room. And what is this big chalkboard? And what are all these uh, cities with the numbers next to them? <laughs> and it was my first uh, introduction into what a, a, a bookie joint was like. Sure. And that was just the way of life. Yeah. It wasn't seedy or, or degenerate. It just was. Just what you did. Zit to zit. No, nobody, you don't say anything. You don't talk about this. So it was, um, it was a different world. But that's why when I went to Channel 5, I wasn't like, hey, look at me, I'm a smart guy. Let me yeah. tell you how much I know. It was shut your mouth. You're you're seen and not heard yeah. until somebody asks you a question. And you better be ready to answer you it. Better be ready to answer. Yep. So you go from one legend to working with another legend and you get the job with the Indians. How how did that come about? <laughs> Again, my career, it's it's bananas. Like I, I I feel bad when kids ask me like, "Hey, how should I like don't list don't follow my path because sure. it's just a it's a series of fortunate breaks." Um so I work I was working at Channel 5. It's the end of the 1999 baseball season and Dave Nelson, who had taken over when Herb Score had retired, uh was going to go back to coaching. So he was going to leave the radio broadcast and there was an opening there and I had done the radio pregame show uh, for the Indians since 1994. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, there was a familiarity. Rick Manning and I had already co-hosted a TV show. The team was so doggone popular in the 90s. So there was a familiarity. They knew me. They knew my work. I had filled in on, uh, on radio and on TV, play-by-play, -play, a couple of times. So I said, hey, can I, can I have a chance? Yeah. And, and fortunately, they hired me. And so I left Channel 5 af after 1999. And beginning in 2000, I went full time with uh, Tom Hamilton and Mike Hegan. So we had a sort of a three man weave. Mike did half the games on TV and half the games on radio. So for half the games, it would be just Tom and myself. Okay. And then for the other half of the games, we'd have a three man rotation, which was really convoluted. We couldn't even remember who's on the air this then. Is it me? Is it you? <laughs> but we had a great time. It was a, it was a fantastic working relationship. Um, learned a lot from both of them, and. And then after 2006, uh, at the end of that season, they came to me and said, uh, we would like to uh, offer you an opportunity to move from radio over to TV. Yeah. And, and basically, I would be the play-by-play -play guy for all the games, working with Rick Manning. And, I mean, it wasn't really a choice. Yeah. And it wasn't like, well, I really got to think about this. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I got to go talk to my wife. I got to yeah. go talk to my guy at H&R Block. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> so it was just – it was one of those opportunities. It's like, this doesn't come along very often. Yeah. So – um, yeah, so in 2007, Rick and I started working together as a, as a team on, on TV, and we've been together ever since. And we welcomed Andre in, uh, I want to say it was 2000, 2015. Yeah. And he's been with us ever since, and he's been a fantastic addition. Yeah. And uh, we just – look, I can just tell you complete honesty, not every broadcast crew has a great uh, relationship off the air. Yeah. They may fake it on the air – but then when the game ends, they're all going separate ways. Totally. But the three of us, we ride together to a lot of the games. That's awesome. Um, and we, we cut up. We make fun of each other. We have fun. Uh, we, when the game's serious, we try to be at our serious best. When the game's horrible, we try to cut up and just make it as entertaining as possible. Totally. Because some games get away from you, and you have those nights. But the, the most important thing is that 
if, if Andre and I have done our homework and done our work, we can provide you a lot of the information, the background and the details. And Rick's just going to give you that perspective of, I've been there. I know what this is like. Yeah. Uh, the thing I've always loved about him, he will never, well, when I played, never once. Yeah. He, you literally have to pull it out of him. He just doesn't like to refer to his career because he, in his mind, like people don't care about my career. Well, we do. He just doesn't want to go down that road uh, very often. But he can give you the player's perspective. Well, right here, he's got to do this. Why? Well, because I, I know. Sure. I've been there. I know what that's like. Uh, as a hitter, as a fielder, as a defender. So it's a pretty good – we've got a really good mix, a great production crew behind us that, that gives us, I mean, so much support uh, from our producer Jim Murphy and director Mike Simons and Steve Bardo, who does our all of our replays, and he builds these replay packages and flashbacks because he'll hear us talking about something, and then he'll say, oh, I remember that game. And he'll get on the computer and he'll find the clip from that game that might have been a year ago, two years ago, three years ago or more, but he'll find it. And then within 30 seconds, hey, we've got that flashback that you guys were just talking about. That's like, awesome. What? <laughs> like, geez. Yeah. So we've got a great crew. And again, this goes back to, this is what I loved about athletics. Uh, if you work as a team, you can achieve some things that are pretty special. Sure. If you work as an individual, you might get some individual success. But as a team, you'll never, you'll never grow. You'll never really get it going. And, and I think our, for the most part, I think the people who watch enjoy the fact that, you know, we try to keep it lively. Uh, yeah. We're going we're gonna to inform you. We're hopefully we'll entertain you a little bit. But at the end of the day, when the game's on the line, when, when it's at those most important moments, we're talking about what's happening right there on the field. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was going to ask you, you know, what makes a good broadcast team? But I think you kind of just, you said is it, it – it's chemistry, and you and you can't fake chemistry. You can't. And you can't. You can't create it. Yeah. You can't force it, and you can't fake it. it. It either happens organically, or it doesn't. It's the same way in a clubhouse. When a team comes together, no general manager, no manager. There's no playbook for they it. They have no idea. Yeah. Um, I can give you a great example for that, and that was when Tito, uh, when he was managing, and and he had Jason Giambi. And nobody knew that Jason Giambi was going to come in and be the spark that he was. He was at the end of his career. Yeah. It's just like years prior, we had Trot Nixon who came in, and Trot Nixon was at the end of his career. But in 07, he was a, a lightning rod for that club because totally. he had been through the wars. He knew what it took. And the guys looked to him in tight, tough spots and, and rallied around him. So those things just happen or they don't happen. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to figure out why, they, why it works. Sometimes it's hard to figure out why it doesn't. Um, but if you have the right people with the right collective mindset, which is it has to be about we rather than me. And if you, if you can subjugate your own ego for the good of the, the, the group, you've got a chance to achieve special things. If it's always about me, that's where it gets murky and it gets difficult. Yeah. And, and you know, kind of going back to what you're talking about, this is at the very nature of it. It's, it, it isn't. A, to a degree, an egocentric business. You know, we, you have to have a little bit of an ego to go on camera and to talk, you know, but it takes a right type of person to be able to set that aside to be able to come together for a great product. And I think you guys have really done that. And, you know, as I was saying, it, it shines on air. Yeah, because look, it's, it's like, what do we talk about? Uh, you know, as when you're a teammate, you have to be able to pass the ball. Totally. And let that guy, if the defense is coming to you, if they're going to stack the, the, the line and stop the run, then the running back has to be able to say, well, I'm not going to get my 20 cut touches tonight. I'm going to have to block, and we're going to have to throw the ball. Yeah. If they're dropping back, then the quarterback's not going to be able to throw it 30 times. He's going to have to hand it off and, and let the running back have his day. You have to be willing as a, as a teammate to understand and recognize what is the best thing for us to succeed tonight. And when you get to that point, then anything is possible. Yeah. So I'm curious about just about, about you. So, like, it's, it's game day. What's kind of your routine? How are you getting prepared for the game? What, and there's, I mean, 162 of these things. I mean, baseball season's forever. So what are the day-to-day -day things that, you know, it's, you're, you're waking up, game's at 7.05. What are you doing? Um, I mean, this is really boring. <laughs> But I, you know, there's, there's usually some pre-work that I'll do at home, yeah. which is just pulling things uh, that 
you know, whether they're numbers, uh, st certain statistics, certain things that I'm looking for. Uh, I'm going through uh, what we call clips, which are news stories based on the opponent we're playing. So I'm going to scour those, see if there's any clips I can pull out, anecdotal type information yeah. that I can use. This is all stuff that I can use to sort of create some background information to help the broadcast. Um, then I get to the yard uh, for a 7 o'clock game, try to get there at the latest by 4, sometimes a little bit earlier. Gives you time. If you need to go down and talk to a player or a coach or the manager one-on-one, -on -one, that gives you time to be able to do that. Um, maybe watch a little BP. Just kind of try to pick up on the vibe. How, how are things going today? Sure. You know, is this a, is this a cl club that's dragging? Yeah. Are they looking for energy? Or are they chomping at the bit, can't wait to get going? So there are things that you just you just checking in, just trying to figure out how how are things going today. Uh, fill out the lineup card. Spent a lot of time with Rick and Andre going over what are the storylines. You know what's what are we talking about today? And it might be things that are happening outside of our orbit. It might be things that are happening in New York or things that are happening in L.A. Other other teams. What's happening in the division? Chicago, the Tigers, the Twins. What's going on in Kansas City? So we're we're kind of shooting information back and forth. We tape our open. Because you never want to be live on the air when the national anthem is playing. Yes. That's a no-no. Yes. So we always tape that very first part of the telecast where Rick and I come on camera. Do you guys have prompt or is this all? Um, no, it's uh, all ad. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We, you know, we, we, you know, we act, we act like we're going home in the same car together after the game. Yeah. You know, <laughs> hey buddy, how's it going? Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. And so you guys have bunk beds. <laughs> yeah, we we do the open. We finish taping the open, and then it's then it's just that's that's like lockdown time, and so I can. I can sort of maybe relate this if, if anybody remembered. Tito would be the first guy in the dugout before a game, maybe an hour before the game. That was his time to relax. Yeah. He'd put his lineup card up on a tape. He'd look at it, and he'd just kind of take in the environment, take in the atmosphere. And that's what we're doing. So that hour before the game, after we tape the open, 7 o'clock game, we tape it at 6. So by the time we're wrapped up, we got about 45 minutes to just chill. And that's when you're just going over any last-minute notes – you're kind of getting your mind into okay. It's it's time to get thinking about the game and, and how how we're gonna attack everything. And then it's go time. You yeah. know when the when the when they give you the countdown and you're on. It's just you just go. And then again, with baseball, the beauty of it is you don't have six days between games. Yeah. You you got six hours sometimes, twelve hours. You're you're right back on the air. So each game builds on the next. So the story just continues to pile up. And I always say what I love about baseball is the, the journey begins this year, begins April 20, or March 28th in Seattle or uh, uh, in Oakland. That I know. Yeah. I don't know where, the, where it's going to go from there. Yeah. You know, we, we don't know if this team's going to be healthy, if it's going to have injuries, if there's going to be a breakout season by somebody we didn't see coming. That's the most fun part. You don't know where the story's going to take you, but you're going to build that story. And by the end of the season – You've got 162 chapters. Yeah. And you can go back through and look. Oh, I remember when this happened. Remember when that happened. Remember this story. So many crazy things can happen that you didn't see coming. That's why Herb Score used to say it's a fool's errand. People ask, hey, how, what's your prediction? <laughs> you know, I'm not Karnak. Like, I don't have I don't a prediction. Know. I have yeah. no idea. Baseball is impossible to predict because the teams with the highest payrolls don't always win. Absolutely. If it was that easy – then it wouldn't be worth Do having that, a season. That means, yeah, like might as well not go out this season because the Dodgers are going to win. Yeah, you, you just know? never know. And that's what's fun uh, is the, the things you don't, you know. Again, several years ago, who saw Jose Ramirez coming? Nobody. Yeah. Nobody saw him coming the way. Francisco Lindor, yeah, he was a first-round pick. There was a lot of hype expectations. He fulfilled many of those. But it's the great stories like Jose Ramirez and, and – you know, Josh and Bo Naylor. Those are yeah. great stories. Andre Jimenez, a young kid who gets traded in the Francisco Lindor trade. Imagine what, what he's going through his head. These people expect me to be Lindor. I can't be <laughs> yeah. Lindor. And yet he becomes the platinum gold glove winner, one of the best defenders of the game in the game right now. So those are the stories, uh, the human interest side, the, the fun things that, that happen off the field that guys uh, – allow you in on like Stephen Kwan becoming a, you know, he's this great chess savant. Yes. Loves, loves playing Plays chess. Plays against these high school kids. Yeah. yeah it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. So that's what, that's what's enjoyable about the season. And those are the things that just build day after day after day until you get to the end. And now you've got, you've got a complete novel for that year. Sure. Yeah. And we're hoping that this year is a novel in well into the playoffs, but someone that we're going to be without 
in this in this year is of course Tito Francona. You know, you, you spend a lot of time with, with Tito. I know. What did he, and this is a stupid question, but what did he mean to this organization? What did he mean to the city? And how did he when he came in change the culture? Well, that's the most important thing. Uh, we had fallen as an organization uh, to a point where um, I think people outside of Cleveland looked at the Indians organization as and, and kind of said, "What happened? Yeah. What's happened to Cleveland? They have fallen to a point where." You know, will they be relevant again in our in the immediate future? And what Terry Francona did is when he stepped in, he restored us to respectability instantly mm -hmm. because he his reputation, uh, his resume, what he'd already done gave us cachet. Yeah. So we were able to get free agents now that wanted to come to Cleveland and we could swing some trades and, and make some things happen that, that jump started the rebuild very quickly and very rapidly. And hey, Tito would be the first to tell you, he didn't do this by himself. The front office, the, the people behind the scenes deserve a great deal of credit for developing those young pitchers, yeah. making those key trades for a Corey Kluber that nobody knew who he was when we traded for him and became a two-time Cy Young Award winner. That is a big part of the equation. But Tito, he, he gave everybody in the organization reason to puff their chest out and walk proud and be proud. Hey, we're, we are, we are going to be okay. We are going to get this turned around. I don't think anybody saw it coming as fast as it did. I mean, yeah. his first year, they're in the playoffs. Yeah. This is, it was an it was incredible immediate. turnaround. And then a few years later, they're in the World Series. So that was most important. And then I think what, what he did consistently was uh, his open door communication policy, his, his honesty. You yeah. know, and that's what, that when I talked to Stephen Vogt, uh, the one, the one common, and I, and I will never, I, I promised myself I'm not going to try and ever compare him to Tito because that's yeah, not, fair, not to fair to anyone, no, no. right? The one common thread I saw in my first conversation with Stephen Vogt is I asked him, I said, you know, what have you seen from managers that you've played for? Because he's had a lot of different examples to look at. What will you take that you think will be most important for you as a manager? And he said, honesty. Yeah. And that's what Tito excelled at. It may not be what you want to hear, Austin, yeah. but I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. Mm -hmm. You may be pissed off because I, I can't take you on the 25-man roster. You're not going to come with the team out of spring training. Or I might have to send you down in the middle of the season because, you know, your batting average or your, your at-bats just aren't competitive right now. We need you to get your confidence back. You may not like that, but I'm never going to lie to you. Yeah. Because if you try to BS a ball player – you're dead. He, you have lost him. He will never trust you again. And I think because they were both players, Tito and Vote, they understand and respect that, that that's what the player wants. Just be honest with me. I may not like it, but I will respect you, and I will always believe you as long as you don't lie to me. And I think that's, that's what the one trait that the two of them have in common. And I think Steven's going to be fine. He, he seems to be a guy that uh, understands – how to empower yeah. the people around him, his, his coaching staff, and I think the players will, will love playing for him. Bottom line is we don't know until he gets out there and does it, though. Yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to it. And you know, just the, the brief second I had with, with Steven, came in super humble, you know, down-to-earth kind of guy, and uh, that, that was a lot of, the, of, of Tito, too, you know. Um, kind of a man of the people, as you would say. Self-deprecating humor. Uh, that's the best. Yeah. Absolutely. I feel like I need a good Tito story, and I feel like you're the... You're, you're, uh, don't incriminate the man, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I, feel, I feel like I need a good Tito story. Uh, I, mean, I mean, he just... There's so many great stories and, and so many things that... I think what made him endearing is his, his ability to just poke fun at himself. Yeah. And whether he did that to deflect the attention away from his team if they weren't playing well. or I remember he told us a story in the World Series about him waking up in the middle of the night because he, he thought he had glaucoma and he realized it was just ice cream <laughs> smeared all over his glasses because <laughs> he had ordered like $75 worth of room service ice cream in the middle of the night because he was hungry and he couldn't sleep. But, I mean, those were the great moments. But, but to me, my favorite, and, and this is just me, this is how I operate. Yeah. My favorite Tito moment was we go to New Brighton, Pennsylvania, and uh, I go with him. I, I sit in, uh, in his dad's house. I talk to his dad. I interview Tito. <clears throat> and then we go to this little place, and a lot of his high school teammates are there. So now I'm interviewing his, his high, school, high school teammates. That's awesome. And his high school coach. And his high school coach, who couldn't have been much older than Tito at that time when really? he coached him in high school, 
he starts telling me the story that before the uh, – I'm on the thing. So in 2004, the Red Sox are playing the Cardinals. It's game four. They're going for a sweep. Tito's in the dugout. He calls his high school baseball coach before the game to really? talk to him. Wow. And this guy gets really emotional. Um, I, I, I apologize. I forget it. Greg, uh, I can't remember his last name. But he's telling me the story, and he gets very emotional on camera because he his in his in his mind – Tito's managing in the World Series. He's in the major leagues. And who does he call before the first pitch? His high school baseball coach. Yeah. If that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about who he, Tito is and, and how he values the people in his life and those relationships, then you, you've missed the whole point. Yeah. And, and that's that, to me, that's the story that I'll always remember, I'll always take with me because I think all of us have those relationships. I know I do. I have those relationships with my high school friends and teammates that I still hold near and dear. I saw my high school coach, my high school football coach, uh, this past October in a game down at, at Ashland High School. And, you know, we, we got to sit and talk for several minutes. And, you know, I, I, I value that. Um, yes, it was a very small moment in my life, but it was such a profound and important moment in my life. Yeah. And he had an impact. And I, I, I will never miss an opportunity to, to talk to him and, and tell him what that meant to me. Yeah. And th as you're talking about, that, that, mean, that says everything you need to know about Tito has reached the height of heights and to still be that centered and grounded to, yeah. um, you know, thank the ones that got him there. And then he know? told me, don't, be, don't forget to hit the hot dog shop on your way out of town. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because Tito's diet was like an eight-year-old's. <laughs> So I got, of course, I go to the hot dog shop. I get a couple of conies slathered up with everything. I'm like, he wasn't wrong. Yeah. This is pretty damn good. <laughs> Those are the go-tos. Those are the go-tos, huh? Um, let's see. How much time we got? Oh, we, we, we got a few minutes. How are you doing on time? I'm fine. I got You're nowhere good. to go. <laughs> all right. Screw Season it. doesn't start for another 20 days. I, I love, yeah. All right. Let's rock and roll here. All right. So I got a question for you. And to, to kind of divert the, the conversation here, I have YouTube TV, Okay. I have not been able, I, last year I download, I didn't do a lot of reading. I don't read a whole lot. I tried to download the Bally's Plus app, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch the Guardians game today. This is going to be fantastic. I cannot wait. Get there and, like, okay, where's, where's the Guardians game? It's not, it wasn't on Bally's Plus. What's going on with Bally's? What can we expect this year? First of all, and uh, I, don't want you, I don't want you to get in trouble no, with your employer. No, first of all, the fact that you don't read reminds me. Do you know the comedian Nate Bargatze? <laughs> yes. I mean, he's got a whole bit about reading. There's so many words. There's so many words. It's just, and it, it just doesn't end. I'm an action guy. Because I'm trying to keep my head above water, man. <laughs> Give me a break. I love that. Because I, there was a time when I, when I was younger, I felt the same way about reading. I'm like, oh, every time I would crack open a book, I'd be asleep in five minutes. Yeah. Now I love reading. I don't know what happened, but I, I, I'd love. I can, Big audiobook guy. Yeah, nah. I, like I, I want to hear it in my head. I want to hear the voices in my head and create the characters in my head. Yeah. Anyway, um, where we are with Bally is wherever you watched the games last year, that's where we are this year. Okay. So, I mean, I, I don't really have any updates as far as anything else. So I'll watch concerned. it at the bar or at the games. Yeah, however you consumed our product last year is the same way you'll get our product this year. If, if, it's, if you're a cable TV subscriber, that's the, it's the same channel. If you were direct TV, it's the same channel. Um, I don't know how the, <laughs> how the app works, and I know there are some streaming issues because of blackout rules and yeah. all that as, as concerned. And I know that's a major sticking point, and that's something that everybody in baseball and the TV, they're trying to work through is like, how do we get more people to be able to consume our product? Yeah. And, and we're not there yet, obviously. Yeah. And that's something that everybody's working very hard on. I don't, they, you know, I'm not in the high level meetings. Absolutely. I uh, never will be. Um, and uh, I just hope that in the future that we will be able to maximize the viewing experience for as many people as possible. And I know right now, unfortunately, that is limited. And that's, a, that's just a crazy thing in our world where how could you have foreseen this? You know, when I first started out in the business, there were, there were still just it was Channel 3, Channel 5, Channel 8. Channel 43 had a, had a newscast that was at 10 o'clock and everybody was like, ha, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Nobody will ever watch 10 o'clock news. And then Fox bought Channel 8, and they're at 10 o'clock, and everyone, uh-oh. Yeah. And so, the, the, you know, all of a sudden, the medium sort of shifted, and then Channel 19 came on, and now there's another player in, in local news. And then before you knew it, there's 5,000 channels yeah. at, at your disposal. So the, the medium, the landscape has changed. But even with that, 
And now it's even gone farther with streaming. That's what I mean. Yeah. Could we have ever foreseen how it was going to change with my kids don't watch TV on TV. They watch it here. They watch all their programs here. They, they call them up and I don't, it's, it's bananas. So yeah. it's a different world. And I think everybody, the people who run the TV stations and the networks and the people who have the sports leagues and the, and the entertainment pro, they're trying to figure out how do we all na- navigate the new landscape? And also to make money with it. No, obviously, obviously, that's the big thing. You, you know, know, I mean, how do you? Because you can just put it on streaming. You might not make any money, but you yeah. know, it's 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 fascinating. It yeah. really is fascinating, and to and to see, it, how long is it going to take for this all to sort of fit? Yeah. So that you don't have people going, I can't watch the games because they're not on my whatever I have. I'm totally. Like, that's that would have not, never been a thing twenty years ago. Yeah. But that's where we are, and I think everyone's working hard to try to figure out how to best make that mesh together. Yeah. How have you liked the new changes that they've made in baseball? I think so far, I mean, as long as you don't mess with the, the, the actual playing of the game, all yeah. right? So, again, <laughs> baseball fans are different. Like, yeah. Football fans, I don't think they really cared when they moved the hash marks in closer. That didn't, what's that going to do? The idea was... When they did that in 1974, the idea was that's going to open up the passing game. Yeah. Because the hash marks are, marks are tighter. It's going to open. And what happened? There were more guys that ran for 1,000 yards than ever before in the history <laughs> of the NFL. The and eventually, though, they figured it out, and it did open up, and the game became a passing league. In the NBA, the three-point line was like, what a gimmick. Yeah. In the first year of the three-point line, nobody shot from out there because it was a low-percentage shot. But eventually, because we are humans, we adapt, and they figured out how to make that shot more with more frequency and now it's not considered a high percentage a low percentage shot yeah. now it's we need guys who can shoot the three absolutely and they're going to camp tells out you there to take it. Yeah. and bomb, bomb away so baseball hasn't made too many changes that drastic yeah with the exception there was two of, right at once with the exception of we're going to put a runner at second base that to me was the most yeah. what yeah because that changes the actual outcome of a game. It's, it's like hard to get a guy on hockey. second base. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, but what it did do during the pandemic, which with, with the whole situation that occurred there, it kept the wear and tear on the bullpen because you're, you basically, you're not going to have 15 and 16 inning games. And you know, we've had some doozies over the years. Um, and those games now with the runner at second base, they usually end in the 10th, maybe the 11th. Yeah. Very rarely do they go beyond that anymore. So to that end, I, I don't know. That's the one I struggle with the most. I don't mind the pitch clock. I thought I was going to hate it. I mean, the, the, the whole beauty of baseball is there is no clock. Yeah. The beauty of it is, you know, for as long as I've been in the game, there are two-to-one games that last too long, and there are ten-to-nine games that don't last long enough. Yeah. It, you know, people think that, oh, a two-to-one game must have been a great. No, it was brutal. There were 18 <laughs> walks. Nobody could get a hit with a runner in scoring position. It was an exercise in futility. And then there are 10 to 9 games that are just thrilling because there's so much action. But you know what? You play 162 of them, you're going to have some clunkers. Yeah. You're going to have some games that aren't a masterpiece. Then you're going to have games that are like, wow. We, Rick and I walk out, that was a great game. Some yeah. nights you walk out like, wow, that was really fun. And then there are nights you walk out where you're literally like, we're dazed. We're like, <laughs> we're driving home. We don't even speak because like, what did we just watch? What the hell? That was horrible. <laughs> so you just, you know, it, it comes with the with the nature of, of the, of a long season, but all in all, <clears throat> I like the changes. I like cutting the fat out. Yeah. You know, we don't need timeout. Let's go talk to the pit timeout. Let's walk around the mountain. It, it started out. getting out of control. It, yeah, It did. It, it got did. a little bit too far. And so they've cut the fat and I, I think that's okay. That's a good thing, but you still need good play. People want to see action. Yeah. You know, walks, strikeouts, home runs are brutal for the game because nothing happens. Absolutely. I mean, home runs, obviously, something happens, but not a lot of action. Once the ball clears the fence, that's it. It's like, all right, um, another round of beers. So when you get action in the game and a ball in play that's hit up the middle that's an out is still an action play. If that shortstop's got to go more than two or three steps, he's got to do something above ordinary. Yeah. And that's fun. That's when you get those things happening in the game, more of that t- type of action then it's fun for the viewer, fun yeah. for the people who are watching in person. Sure. You know, you're talking about the evolution of the game, and I heard you talking um, a, f- a few months ago about, you know, 
different eras and how you really can't compare these eras. And uh, you were you were talking about Bob Feller in 1976, and I was like blown away by this stat. He threw 36 complete games. You don't even have the opportunity to throw. 30 complete games, basically, in today's game, nor would it ever happen. But also talking about the uh, innings pitch that he had, over 370 yeah. or something. And now, in today's era, you're only seeing two to five players get over 200 innings yeah. pitched. You know, so that was in, in the 70s. That was almost 50 years ago. You know, in today's age, you know, obviously it's changed since then. You know, let's look forward. What, what, what do you see the big changes that are going to be if you're using your you know, crystal ball 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, what do you think will be the biggest trends, the biggest changes in baseball? I think though, I think the, the pitching is becoming more and more specialized. Mm-hmm. Um, there is this sort of notion that starting pitchers will go, uh, will go less and less mm-hmm. and relieved pitchers will pitch more and more. I don't think we'll, I don't foresee that happening, uh, at least in my lifetime experience with the game. Uh, but I do, th- I do see where, look, it's just simple math. When Bob Feller pitched, and, and he pitched farther back than the 70s, Bob pitched in the 40s. Yeah. He made his debut in the 30s, 40s. You know, he pitched at the end of his career in 1954 when they went to the World Series. But, but when Bob pitched, you didn't want the guy in the bullpen yeah. coming in because that guy was out there because he couldn't pitch in the straight rotation. I had rotation. that date wrong. My bad on That's that. Okay. It was 56. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want somebody calling. <laughs> I said, you said 1976. <laughs> you idiot. Yeah. yeah. So uh, now – you're paying our relievers tens of millions of dollars. Maybe yeah. not in our club right now, but in the free agent going market, these guys are valuable, valuable pitchers. So you're not going to just stash them out there and only use them sparingly. You're going to bring them in. And this is where the game started to shift. You know, Tito would tell you he got too much credit. He didn't change the game in, in 2016. Yeah. But the way he used Andrew Miller earlier in the game than anybody thought was reasonable. Yes has sort of shifted people's thought process to where man, we can leverage some of our better relievers earlier in the game if we think that's the way to win. The, the gamesmanship between him and Joe Madden, because I think Joe Madden picked on it because, you know, I uh, grew up outside Chicago, so I watched a lot of Cubs games. So it was during that World Series. Bastard. I know. <laughs> Sick son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and But it was, you know, I watched a lot of Cubs games, and we were like, he's – taking a page out of Tito's book right now. And and it was from there that you could really see yeah. the gamesmanship that from really start to evolve in Catch Fire. It was really in that 2016 World Series where I think it really became part of the game. And I think, too, just the, fi- the, just the, the finances alone. Yeah. When you have 10 to 15 and upwards of 20-plus million dollars invested in a starting pitcher, if he's having a bad day, Get in the old days – yeah, he's gonna wear it. Let Just him leave him out there. He got to. He got to suck up some innings. He's got to help the team. Not now. We can't afford for that guy to get hurt. So if you have to take him out early, now you've put stress on the bullpen. There's a domino effect. That maybe not the next day or the day after, but maybe three days down the road. Now the bullpen's gassed. Now we've got to make roster moves to supplement and fortify the bullpen because so and so only gave us two innings his last time out because he was he was bad. Yeah. Uh, we're in the past. That guy's going to pitch five innings, even if he's horrible. Regardless. You're going out there. You're going to wear it because we need to get those innings uh, off the books and, and save the bullpen. But I think more and more bullpens are just getting um, – look at what the Tampa Bay Rays have done with Kevin Cash. Yeah. The opener, right, where a guy comes in, he pitches just the first, maybe the first, second inning. And then you bring in the the, the guy that eats up innings. Yeah. You know, the guy's going to go hopefully three or four innings. They, they kind of flip the model a little bit. I don't know that that will ever get a stronghold to where that's going to happen with every team, but I could see it shifting more towards that. Um, but I, I just don't – I don't think we'll see a day where the starting pitcher is gone. But I think if there's one thing I see shifting, it's more – bullpens will become more – even more uh, relied upon in the future than they, than they are now. Offensively, I'd like to think that we're getting – Back to an era of action ball where we're we're getting more hitters that put the ball in play, gap-to-gap hitters, stolen bases, uh, guys who can do everything as opposed to muscle-bound sluggers who do one thing, strike out and hit home runs. That's a a boring brand of baseball. But you need some. Yeah. You need to have a couple of guys in your lineup that that strike fear in the pitcher. Like, if I don't don't make my pitch, this ball is going 500 feet. You, You need some of that. 
but I don't think we'll see a lineup like the 97 inning or the 96 innings uh, Indians 97 98 where they had all stars up and down the lineup where Travis Fryman who was batting cleanup for the Tigers came to Cleveland the next year and he's hitting seventh yeah I don't think we'll see lineups that stacked and that that fat uh, with power like we what we like we had back then yeah well, steroids had a little bit. You know, to do there was there was some of that in that era. <laughs> yeah, I'm not pointing fingers. All right, before we go, let's do a few quick hitters. Okay, this is this is where I stink. What do you think? But go ahead. Okay. Give, give All right. Shot. Favorite ballpark. Favorite ballpark. Um, see, I, I I'm so bad at this. <laughs> So you go to them all. I love I there I am I am a, I guess I'm an, a romantic at heart, so I love the the history and the just the the nuance of the old ones. Yeah. I love Fenway. I love Wrigley. I love old Yankee Stadium. Hate new Yankee Stadium. Um, so I I, I still and they're the worst ones. Fenway and Wrigley are the worst ones to work in. Oh, I can imagine. I'm sure you're working in a peanut. The box. accommodations yeah. are horrible, but I love the ambiance and that that old ballpark feel. You just Nothing go back. Like, it. like walking into Wrigley, you just I mean, like now it's it. a little different because yeah. they've definitely Disney fight it. But I mean it yeah. It like going into there, you still feel such a sense of nostalgia. But I will say this, I, I, I enjoy going I mean, obviously our ballpark is still number one. I, yeah. I just think the way they created our ballpark, the way they built it, the way you look over the downtown skyline from where I sit, it, it's got everything you want in a ballpark. Yeah. So ours is always number one. I assume you're asking me outside of Cleveland. Yes. So that's why I say the old ones, and then I love going Good to Safeco in Seattle. Safeco yeah. in Seattle is beautiful. You get the the rolling roof. If it rains, you're yeah. covered. But most of it, but you've always got that air, that that fresh uh, air off the Puget Sound rolling in there. Uh, Petco in San Diego. Come on, mm. it's San Diego. What's not to love there? That's pretty fantastic. And um, I mean, PNC in Pittsburgh is a pretty spectacular look as the well. View there with the yeah. bridges and the river. I mean, they, they did a really nice job. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's it's hard to pick one that is my favorite. Sorry, for a fan experience, Progressive is is awesome. It, it, for the social experience that you can get at Progressive Field, you know, I grew up where you went to Wrigley, you sat at your seat, and that was it. Where at Progressive, you know, what they've done with the corner bar, and you know, it's it's very, and you can walk around the entire. Play. I mean, it, it's awesome for like a, as a social aspect of baseball um it, it is a lot of fun all right next your favorite all-time indian slash guardian i knew you were gonna ask me how that about too. that you dirty dog <laughs> so i could never name one because uh you know that would be that would be like asking a parent who's your, who's your favorite child like, yeah. i just can't do it there's, okay. there's so many good dudes over the years i'll name off several that i mean are, are at the top of my list and one of them's our first base coach sandy alomar yeah charlie Nagy. Jim Tomey, I mean, those those three guys are right there at the top of the list. Johnny Mack, John McDonald, um, those are guys. That Travis Hafner, I mean, it's just it's it's very difficult to to narrow the list to one. Uh, those were guys that that were great. Um, that I, I probably bring those up as immediate examples because I've known them the longest. Yeah, I mean, Sandy was rookie of the year in 1990. I was that was my first year working at Channel Five. Sure, for covering the ball club. So. I've known him, and I've known Jim Tomey and Charlie Nagy pretty much their entire careers. And and we've maintained friendly relationships. So, and I don't see Jimmy that often, but I went to Cooperstown when he was inducted, and, and he came over, and we sat down, did a long interview, and it was like it was like we had never missed a day. That's awesome. And that's a pretty cool thing when you know you don't have to keep up with somebody every single day, but you have all those experiences in common in games that you covered and he played in and, and watched and, and all those experiences. So that's really cool. Um yeah, those those guys are fantastic. Just good good people, good yeah. humans. Yeah, love that. All right, I know you said you hate doing predictions, so let's do this. Over or under 89 wins for the season? You suck. <laughs> <laughs> I have no that's a, idea. That's a good way to put it. I literally have no idea. Over or under? I, I mean, I'm always the eternal optimist. Do you think it's going to be a good season? We'll put yes. it that way. All right. Yeah. Mike Segge so. was a longtime traveling uh, secretary for the for the ball club. He used to crush me every spring. He's like, what do you think about the, this team? And I would say, I think it's a good team. I think that – and he'd just look at me like, oh, youthful optimism. He'd yeah. walk away in disgust. I love it. You know, because I just – just have my nature. Like, I'm, I'm never going to go into a season and say, Austin, we're going to lose 100 games. Yeah, and, right. and I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> You'll probably lose your job. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I will not reveal the name. But I had a manager once tell me, hey, this is going to be a long year. Get yeah. ready. It's going to be a long year. We made the playoffs. Really? 
Yeah. So you, even the manager of the damn team yeah. thought we were going to be terrible and we made the playoffs. So that's why I'm telling you this is ridiculous. It is moronic. Did it is a maybe fool's two, errand. Was that two years ago? I'm not going to say. <laughs> I told you. I am not going to admit All right. when that happened in 2022. Who's... <laughs> Love it. Who who's a guy to look out for this year? I think or a look, breakout season. This is probably not uh, not news if you've followed the club, but if you're a casual fan and haven't really followed closely, remember the name Chase DeLauder. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a number one pick uh, just a couple of years ago out of uh, James Madison University. Big, fast, got some power, outfielder. He's not in sp- big league spring training camp. Sure, he's what they call a guy that comes over. He's an extra man. Well, in one of those games we televised, he hit a home run over the roof in right field out of the stadium uh, in Goodyear, and it's like, whoa. Oh, my. I mean, that's one swing. Yeah. But that one swing caught a lot of attention. Yeah. And two days later, he was starting a game in spring training. So I'm not saying he's going to make the club. I don't think there's any chance he makes the club out of spring training. But that's a name to watch. See what he's doing in the Two minor leagues. Years. Yeah, no, yeah. maybe, maybe yeah. not even that long. Sure. But that's that's a name that's because uh, he's got he's got all the skills that it's hard to teach. Yeah. But when we talked about before, Absolutely. what God put in, uh, he has uh, most of those skills. So that's that's an exciting name I think to remember. Okay. I don't know if I want to end on this, but your worst on-air flub. Oh, jeez. <laughs> 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 all right. So <clears throat> we're in Toronto. Hockey playoff time. Yeah. Playing the Blue Jays. We have a TV in the back of the booth with a hockey game going on because the guys on our crew are watching hockey. Okay. They're yeah. hockey heads. They're yeah. puck heads. Yeah. And uh, it's the uh, Penguins and, uh, and the Capitals are playing. And, uh, and uh, who's, the guy from, uh, who's the guy from Washington? Oh, man. I'm, I'm, for, I'm blanking on his um, name. It's been Al- there forever. Alexander. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Anyway. Who is it, Robbie? Uh, <laughs> okay. It's good stuff. He, uh, he, snipers in, he snipers in a goal. Right as we go to break. Right as we go to break. And, uh, and, and as we go to break, uh, one of our players hit a ground ball to second. He grounds out. And that's the third out. And I think our mics are cut. Okay. <laughs> They're not cut. And just as I look back, I see the puck win. I'm like, oh, you got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> That actually went over the air. I love that for you. And uh, and I think a lot of people thought I was referring to the player that had grounded out yes. weekly. And it had nothing to do with that. Yeah. It was totally unrelated, but it had gone over the air. And we didn't even know it. Because oh, geez. it was some kind of weird audio thing where I didn't hear my headset. So they cut my headset, but the mic stayed hot. So I didn't hear. Rick didn't hear. Nobody heard it except... If you were listening, maybe online or somewhere, I don't know. It was a, it was not a great moment. Not great. Not, not, not great. when, not when the GM is calling you. He's like, "Why are you, so why are you mfing?" Uh, out like, Hold on a second. I got to tell you what actually happened. <laughs> yeah. First of all, mea culpa. I am sorry. Yeah. And, uh, so that was an, that was a flub. It's what my uh, photographer Tim Coffee, one of his first pieces of advice, me goes. Awesome. Loose lips, pink slips. Oh, <laughs> there you go. You know, the, the, one, the one thing that everyone always says is always treat every mic as a hot mic. Yeah. Which is great, but when you're on the air 162 times a year and you're around hot mics all the time, it's easy to forget yeah. that that mic might be hot and you don't know where it's going and where it's piped into. So you just have to, you know, the bottom line is, you know, when you're within range of a microphone, try to remember that it's not locker room talk time. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Good point. I'll write that down. Uh, finally, favorite ballpark meal? Um, really? Do you what? think I go to the ballpark to just eat? No. I haven't been to a game as a fan. <laughs> yeah, what's the, last like, time you, need... what's the last time you went to a ball game as a fan? I'll tell you, I mean, I, I wouldn't even know. Uh, probably... Probably sometime in the 1990s, I, I remember going with my wife and my parents. I think we got, uh, we went to, I had a day off and we went to a game at, at Progressive Field, Jacobs Field then. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, it's, I think it's the only time I've ever been to a game as a fan at that ballpark. That's wild. Yeah. That's but, wild. Um, you know, Andre, when we travel around, he'll, he'll, he'll get some, some uh, somebody will sneak him some stuff and he'll, he'll try it on the air. Uh, so there, there's been some, 
I'm trying to remember. We tried. I think it was called the the Boomstick down in in, uh, in Arlington, the okay. old ballpark, and it was this ridiculous hot dog with chili and cheese and God knows what, and uh, that was pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but Side I, of Pepto Bismol. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I can't think of a, a thing that I you know like oh going to the ballpark I would have to get, you know it's all pretty. You know, most ballparks, you know, it's pretty average stand. I will say this. Ah, oh, here we go. It's here we coming go. back. It here takes we go, a baby. while. Yeah, yeah, he had a filibuster for a little bit. Yeah. Fenway Park, <laughs> I don't know if they still do. They used to have lobster rolls. Oh, jeez. They, they had a stand you could get a lobster roll, and, like, you don't get that in any other ballpark. Yeah. So, I would. Uh, that was that was a go- definite go-to. The uh, the hot dogs at Old Yankee Stadium, there was something about them. They, they grilled them. They didn't boil them. They were fantastic. Yeah. Uh, gotta love that at yeah. Wrigley. They have with the um, the grilled onions. There's something about being that. in a ballpark and the smell of grilled onions yes. wafting through the air. Just like it's a nostalgic thing. It's like all of a sudden you feel like you're eight years old again, yeah. and you just you're happy. It hits, it hits you right <laughs> in the feels, man. Yeah. Speaking of hot dogs, the final final question: Who's your favorite hot dog? Mustard, uh, ketchup, or onion? I'm a mustard guy. I'm a mustard guy as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, that's what's wrong with Andre. Yeah, he's not a must. Yeah, he, he he picked the wrong hot dog to have beef with. Like I like I've said on the air so many times before, Dirty Harry, nobody, I mean nobody, puts ketchup on a hot dog. I agree, <laughs> love that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Underwood, Matt, thank you so much for Thanks all for your time, me. man. Thanks man, we me. did, we did quite a lot. We did quite a while. I think it was an hour ten. Well, I mean, we two guys that get paid to talk. What do you expect? I mean, time flies when you're having fun. You know. <laughs> thank you, buddy. Appreciate right, it. You Go guards. It.